In modern society, anger is the emotion that is disapproved of the very most. In fact, it is so disapproved of that when somebody gets angry, it's not seen as an emotion that somebody is having. It's seen as a character or personality defect. The reason that people are so resistant to anger is that it implies conflict, and so many people see conflict as bad and wrong. The thing is, people are wrong about anger. Anger is a reaction to perceived powerlessness. It occurs when someone or something opposes one of your boundaries. What I mean by a boundary is a personal need of yours, a personal feeling, a personal desire, a personal truth, or one of your best interests. And that opposition induces pain. For those of you who have associated fear with anger, fear is a very painful sensation. So it goes hand in hand with what I'm saying. Anger will escalate to a state of rage when whatever thing or person that opposes the boundary shows a pattern of unworkability, therefore creating this sensation in the person who is feeling the anger and escalating to rage, that no matter what they do, they're not going to be able to change anything to this thing that's opposing their boundaries, and therefore they are losing hope about their capacity to get out of pain or fear. For example, imagine that one of your personal boundaries is that you need a partner who is available, but your partner withdraws. This will cause you to feel pain. If you feel powerless to getting your partner to be available, you will then get angry. And if your anger does nothing to discourage their behavior and encourage a positive change to their behavior, and they continue to be unavailable, they are demonstrating unworkability. It is then likely that the anger will escalate to rage. If you want to learn more about this, you can watch my video titled The Anger Hack, What to Do When You're Upset. When a child is little, a child needs to understand or know that mommy or daddy or any other caregiver is an ally to their best interests. When a child is little and their parent or caregiver opposes one of their boundaries, remember a boundary is one of their needs, one of their desires, something that they perceive to be in their best interests, the parent suddenly doesn't feel like an ally to their well-being anymore. In fact, whatever the parent is doing or not doing is causing them pain. That's terrifying in a world where your entire life experience is controlled by this person. So it kicks a child into a state of powerlessness instantaneously. The child does what he or she can to make sure that his or her parent is allied with him or her. The child gets angry to discourage future opposition disconnection, unavailability, or whatever other behavior the parent is exhibiting, which is threatening to the child. Knowing this, what is interesting is that if you look closely at the genuine purpose behind anger, you will see that it acts to promote a social bond, not disrupt it. If a parent loves a child, or does a good job parenting, when a child becomes angry, thus demonstrating you're not in alignment with me right now, the parent will want the child to feel a sense of security and to feel a sense of well-being and to feel a sense of closeness with them. So they will very quickly seek to reestablish security in the child and seek to reestablish that sense of alignment with their child. They'll seek to create resolve quite quickly. This is a child who will grow up with a healthy relationship to their anger and a healthy sense of self. This will also be a person who grows up to be an adult who has a sense of healthy boundaries. However, not all parents are this way. In fact, unfortunately, the majority of families in the world today are dysfunctional. <laughs> that means that there's a dysfunctional family dynamic going on, and therefore, all of these adult behaviors we would wish to see in a healthy individual, you're not going to see. You're going to see some variation of dysfunction in the adult. So let's take a look at what happens if a parent does not love a child or if a parent does not do a good job parenting a child relative to their own anger. This parent will turn against or withdraw from the child's anger. A hostile parent will use the child's anger against them. This parent will become defensive, belittle or punish the child for being angry in the first place and make it clear that the child's anger has nothing to do with something they are doing to oppose the child's boundaries. Instead, the child's anger means something is wrong with the child. An unavailable parent will use the child's anger as a reason to withdraw further and to become even less available. The message to children in these kinds of households is clear. 
You can do nothing to get me to behave differently, no matter how much it hurts you or scares you. You just have to put up with whatever I do or don't do, or else you are the problem. The person who grows up in this kind of household will learn that anger itself is the problem, that it destroys relationships and weakens bonds, that anger is bad and wrong, and that whoever is angry is the bad guy. And this opens the door to an incredibly upsetting pattern within humanity. There is a rule of thumb in modern society today, and it is this, that the one who gets angry is seen as the one who is creating the problem. The one who gets angry is seen as the one who started the conflict. The one who gets angry is the one who is seen as bad and wrong. And the one who gets angry is the one who loses in the end. Whether or not any of what I've just mentioned is actually true or not. The sad reality is that in society, people can use this truth as a smokescreen for their own dysfunctional behavior and patterns. They can employ all kinds of damaging behaviors, all kinds of patterns that destroy things. They can be pretty malicious, actually. But it doesn't matter, as long as the other person is the one that gets mad. I want you to sit with this for a minute. A person can make themselves seem like the good guy as long as they're not the one that gets angry and the other person is. In today's society, anger can make a person who is not the actual problem in a situation be seen as the problem. It can make a person who is not in the wrong be seen as the one who is in the wrong. It can make a person who did not start the conflict be seen as the one who started the conflict. It can make a person who is the true victim in a situation be seen as the villain instead. And I like to call this the false villain dynamic of anger. So that you can understand this dynamic, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Jody runs a salon. She is driven, she is assertive, and she is intense as a personality type. That personality has allowed her to achieve a lot of success. Tatiana has just recently taken a job at Jody's salon. But the thing is, Tatiana doesn't like to be at the bottom of any totem pole. In fact, Tatiana wants to have her own salon. The thing is, she's never really gone through the motions of actually creating her own salon for herself. Instead, what she exhibits is a pattern of entering into other people's salons and then challenging the person who owns that salon for leadership and for control of the company. At least control over the social sphere within that salon. Tatiana doesn't like the idea of Jody or anyone else calling the shots, even in their own salon. She wants to do things her own way, even if doing so goes against the best interests of Jody and her salon. The reality is that Tatiana took a job at the salon and immediately started a power struggle with Jody. Tatiana started being two-faced. She was pretty friendly to Jody's face, but then behind her back, she would make sure that to all the other people who worked at the salon, she was complaining about all the things that she disliked about Jody. Not only that, she was going to great lengths to figure out what grievances they had with Jody so that she could go ahead and fan those flames. Essentially, Tatiana started this pattern of triangulation. But she also did other things. She would go over Jody's head to negotiate taking clients for herself that Jody had given to other stylists. She confronted Jody in front of every other employee about the idea that Jody should offer them all better benefits. And she generously helped herself to the beverage refrigerator intended for some long guests at the end of the day. One day, this entire situation came to a head when Jody decided that she needed to confront Tatiana with another stylist that was having issues with her too, about her defiant behavior. Now, when they did this, Tatiana saw this as her great opportunity. She started crying immediately and ran out into the middle of the salon. Now, this was right before the salon was opening, and the other stylists were there, all getting their stations ready. Tatiana positioned herself in a place where she knew that the other stylists could hear their conversation. Tatiana started crying and explaining through her sobs about what was going wrong with her life, and everything was hurting her and also how unfair she felt like it really was that everybody else's thoughts and needs came second to Jody's. Now, what do you think was happening when the rest of the stylists were watching this happen, especially given that Tatiana was crying? Does she seem like the underdog or the villain? 
Jodi could see that what Tatiana was doing was trying to paint herself as the victim in front of the other stylists and trying to elicit defense from them. This whole power tactic, this victim control dynamic, made Jodi really angry and she exploded. So what the other stylists got to see is that instead of being super compassionate to Tatiana, instead of treating her like the victim and the underdog, Jodi escalated even further. Now they're watching injustice. <laughs> well, Tatiana's behavior did exactly what it was designed to do. Because Jodi was the one that lost her temper, everyone missed what was actually happening. Many of the stylists, in fact, stepped up to defend Tatiana. They fell for this entire dynamic. They saw Jody as a tyrannical dictator who was picking on Tatiana, who was the obvious victim and underdog. Tatiana was able to use Jody's completely justified anger as a smokescreen for her own dysfunctional behavior. She was able to use it to get the rest of the stylists to fall into the false villain dynamic of anger. As a result of Tatiana's behavior, three of Jody's stylists quit. Her relationship with several others remained tense for years, and when Tatiana quit, she got to walk out the door feeling justified that she was Jody's victim, and keep telling the story like that to everyone else she met, when the truth is in fact the other way around. To understand more about this dynamic, you may want to watch my video titled The Victim Control Dynamic, Escaping Control Drama in Relationships. Another example is that Mason is in court in the middle of a custody battle. His ex-wife is still so insulted by the fact that he asked for a divorce in the first place that she's in this mode of wanting to get back at him in any way that she can. And she figures that the best way to do this is to fight him for the custody of their children. Because of this, she starts to create a parental alienation dynamic with their two children that they have together against Mason. Soon, both of his kids become hostile and spiteful toward him and start criticizing him despite the fact that neither of the children can rationally justify the way they feel towards him suddenly. They start using adult language and phrases to describe their issues with their father because those are the things that they are being told by their mother. On the other hand, they start to think that their mother can do no wrong and is both the victim and the saint in the scenario. They also reject every extended relative that is related to their dad's side of the family. Mason's ex-wife is brilliantly strategic when it comes to crafting the impression for others that she is such a good mother and really only ever cares about the children, unlike her ex-husband, Mason. In fact, she's already managed to dupe the court-appointed therapist about this being the case. At one point, when Mason is confronted about a new untrue allegation that his wife has made, he can't take it anymore and he loses his temper. So what does Mason do? He yells in the courtroom. This is complete bullshit. She's making this shit up on the spot. <laughs> now it's at this point that his ex-wife smiles. Why does she smile? Because she knows he's just lost. And the judge misses that little smile because he's so distracted and upset by the outburst. It takes his ex-wife lawyer two seconds to jump on the opportunity to reinforce in the judge's mind that his client's desire to take away the children from Mason is justified and also what any good mother would do, given that Mason is prone to endangering the children with his rageful outbursts and uncontrolled behavior. And the courtroom actually falls for it. Their resistance to anger has made them fall for the false villain dynamic. The judge now has doubts about Mason's emotional and mental stability as a father. And the outburst confirms the false narrative that Mason's ex-wife has conveyed to the court-appointed therapist. The outburst has made both the judge and the court-appointed therapist biased, which will affect Mason's future court appearances as well as the outcome of the case. In society today, a person can get away with all kinds of things by capitalizing on our resistance as a society to anger as an emotion. Our dysfunctional relationship with anger makes us blind to what the actual problem is, and it makes us blind to who is creating the actual problem. 
This will continue as long as we continue to have a dysfunctional relationship with anger. It will continue as long as we allow ourselves to be duped by the false villain dynamic of anger. Have a good week. If you liked this video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and consider sharing this video with your friends. You can also click on the bell icon to be notified of the next time that I post a video. I want to thank you personally for the bravery that you have to step into awareness. I'll see you in the next video.